6. Though the newspaper account of the burglary failed to mention the false teeth, they worried him considerably. The picture of a human waking in the cool dawn and groping for them in vain, of a soft, toothless breakfast, of a strange, hollow, lisping voice calling the police station, of weary, dispirited visits to the dentist, roused a great fatherly pity in him. Trying to ascertain whether they belonged to a man or a woman, he took them carefully out of the case and held them up near his mouth. He moved his own jaws experimentally. He measured with his fingers, but he failed to decide. They might belong either to a large-mouthed woman or a small-mouthed man. On a warm impulse, he wrapped them in brown paper from the bottom of his army trunk and printed false teeth on the package in clumsy pencil letters. Then the next night, he walked down Fillmore Street and shied the package onto the lawn so that it would be near the door. Next day, the paper announced that the police had a clue. They knew that the burglar was in town. However, they didn't mention what the clue was. 7. At the end of a month, Burglar Bill of the Silver District was the nurse girl standby for frightening children. Five burglaries were attributed to him, but though Dalrymple had only committed three, he considered that majority had it and appropriated the title to himself. He had once been seen, a large bloated creature with the meanest face you ever laid eyes on. Mrs. Henry Coleman, awakening at two o'clock at the beam of an electric torch flashed in her eye, could not have been expected to recognize Brian Dalrymple, at whom she had waved flags last Fourth of July, and whom she had described as, not at all the daredevil type, do you think? When Dalrymple kept his imagination at white heat, he managed to glorify his own attitude, his emancipation from petty scruples and remorses, but let him once allow his thought to rove unarmored, great unexpected horrors and depressions would overtake him. Then, for reassurance, he had to go back to think out the whole thing over again. He found that it was, on the whole, better to give up considering himself as a rebel. It was more consoling to think of everyone else as a fool. His attitude toward Mr. Macy underwent a change. He no longer felt a dim animosity and inferiority in his presence. As his fourth month in the store ended, he found himself regarding his employer in a manner that was almost fraternal. He had a vague but very assured conviction that Mr. Macy's innermost soul would have abetted and approved. He no longer worried about his future. He had the intention of accumulating several thousand dollars and then clearing out going east, back to France, down to South America. Half a dozen times in the last two months he had been about to stop work, but a fear of attracting attention to his being in funds prevented him. So he worked on, no longer in listlessness, but with contemptuous amusement. 8. Then, with astounding suddenness, something happened that changed his plans and put an end to his burglaries. Mr. Macy sent for him one afternoon, and with a great show of jovial mystery, asked him if he had an engagement that night. If he hadn't, would he please call on Mr. Alfred J. Fraser at eight o'clock? Dalrymple's wonder was mingled with uncertainty. He debated with himself whether it were not his cue to take the first train out of town, but an hour's consideration decided him that his fears were unfounded, and at eight o'clock he arrived at the big Fraser house in Fillmore Avenue. Mr. Fraser was commonly supposed to be the biggest political influence in the city. His brother was Senator Fraser, his son-in-law was Congressman Deming, and his influence, though not wielded in such a way as to make him an objectionable boss, was strong nevertheless. He had a great huge face, deep-set eyes, and a barn door of an upper lip the melange approaching a worthy climax in a long professional jaw. During his conversation with Dalrymple, his expression kept starting toward a smile, reached a cheerful optimism, and then receded back to imperturbability. "'How do you do, sir?' he said, holding out his hand. "'Sit down. I suppose you're wondering why I wanted you. Sit down.' Dalrymple sat down. "'Mr. Dalrymple, how old are you?' I'm twenty-three. You're young, but that doesn't mean you're foolish. 
Mr. Dalrymple, what I've got to say won't take long. I'm going to make you a proposition. To begin at the beginning, I've been watching you ever since last Fourth of July, when you made that speech in response to the loving cup. Dalrymple murmured disparagingly, but Fraser waved him to silence. It was a speech I've remembered. It was a brainy speech, straight from the shoulder, and it got to everybody in that crowd. I know. I've watched crowds for years. He cleared his throat as if tempted to digress on his knowledge of crowds, then continued. But, Mr. Dalrymple, I've seen too many young men who promised brilliantly go to pieces, fail through want of steadiness, too many high-powered ideas, and not enough willingness to work. So I waited. I waited to see what you'd do. I wanted to see if you'd go to work, and if you'd stick to what you started. Dalrymple felt a glow settle over him. So, continued Fraser, when Theron Macy told me you'd started down to his place, I kept watching you, and I followed your record through him. The first month I was afraid for a while. He told me you were getting restless, too good for your job, hinting around for a raise. Dalrymple started. But he said after that, you evidently made up your mind to shut up and stick to it. That's the stuff I like in a young man. That's the stuff that wins out. And don't think I don't understand. I know how much harder it was for you after all that silly flattery a lot of old women had been giving you. I know what a fight it must have been. Dalrymple's face was burning brightly. It felt young and strangely ingenuous. Dalrymple, you've got brains, and you've got the stuff in you, and that's what I want. I'm going to put you into the state senate. The what? The state senate. We want a young man who has got brains, but is solid and not a loafer. And when I say state senate, I don't stop there. We're up against it here, Dalrymple. We've got to get some young men into politics. You know the old blood that's been running on the party ticket year in and year out. Dalrymple licked his lips. You'll run me for the state senate? I'll put you in the state senate. Mr. Fraser's expression had now reached the point nearest a smile, and Dalrymple, in a happy frivolity, felt himself urging it mentally on. But it stopped, locked, and slid from him. The barn door and the jaw were separated by a line straight as a nail. Dalrymple remembered with an effort that it was a mouth, and talked to it. "'But I'm through,' he said. "'My notoriety's dead. People are fed up with me.' Those things, answered Mr. Fraser, are mechanical. Linotype is a resuscitator of reputations. Wait till you see the Herald, beginning next week, that is, if you're with us, that is, and his voice hardened slightly, if you haven't got too many ideas yourself about how things ought to be run. No, said Dalrymple, looking him frankly in the eye. You'll have to give me a lot of advice at first. Very well. I'll take care of your reputation, then. Just keep yourself on the right side of the fence. Dalrymple started at this repetition of a phrase he had thought of so much lately. There was a sudden ring at the doorbell. That's Macy now, observed Fraser, rising. I'll go let him in. The servants have gone to bed. He left Dalrymple there in a dream. The world was opening up suddenly. The State Senate, the United States Senate, so life was this, after all. Cutting corners, common sense, that was the rule. No more foolish risks now unless necessity called. But it was being hard that counted. Never to let remorse or self-reproach lose him a night's sleep. Let his life be a sword of courage. There was no payment. All that was drivel. Drivel. He sprang to his feet with clenched hands and a sword of triumph. "'Well, Brian,' said Mr. Macy, stepping through the portieres. The two older men smiled their half-smiles at him. "'Well, Brian,' said Mr. Macy again. Dalrymple smiled also. "'How do, Mr. Macy?' He wondered if some telepathy between them had made this new appreciation possible, some invisible realization. Mr. Macy held out his hand. I'm glad we're to be associated in this scheme. I've been for you all along, especially lately. 
I'm glad we're to be on the same side of the fence. I want to thank you, sir, said Dalrymple simply. He felt a whimsical moisture gathering back of his eyes. End of Dalrymple Goes Wrong by F. Scott Fitzgerald <laughs>